Hi. Well, this is the end of data mining with Weka. Week five has finished. We'll leave the MOOC open for this final week just to let you finish anything off. I'm sitting here in my back garden, actually. Uh, I don't know if you can see my sheep. Uh, you can uh, see them over there in the distance, a couple of sheep. Uh, anyway, here we are. It's a bit of a grey day today in New Zealand. A couple of things uh, came up on uh, class five. Uh, someone talked about uh, in activity 5.2, question two, you had to remove attributes with more than 33% of missing values. And the way to do this is manually in the pre-process panel. Just go through the attributes and click them if you want to remove them after looking at the missing value percentage. There's no way of doing this automatically. Maybe there should be, but I don't think it's all that important because this is just an exercise. In real life, you wouldn't remove those instances you would uh, choose a uh, data mining method that can deal with missing values and deal with them properly. You don't want to throw away information unnecessarily. Which brings us to the next point. Someone said, well, how does J48 treat missing values? That's a very good question, and the answer is not really quite so easy. Uh, you can read about it in the book, of course. But the basic idea is the problem with a missing value is supposing uh, you're going down a decision tree and you have to take a branch that depends on a value of an attribute and that value is missing for this instance, which way do you go? Well, what J48 does is it sends a certain fraction of the instance down one branch and another fraction of the instance down another branch. So it sort of splits the instances up and sends part of them down each branch and then throughout the tree you're dealing with kind of fractional instances. It's not really as hard as it sounds. And that's why when you see a J48 tree uh, on your screen, sometimes you'll find that, you know, at the leaves, it shows you the number of uh, instances that reach that leaf, and sometimes that's a fractional number. And that's why. It's because of those fractional instances caused by missing values. Now the question is, uh, what's the best source of information for Weka output, for the output of classifiers? And uh, Peter uh, suggested... Uh, in a response to that, you can always look at the source code. That's the definitive way of knowing what's going on. You could check the Weka list archives. Uh, there's a link on the Weka homepage. Or you could post a question to the Weka list, if you like. Uh, to those three, I would add a fourth uh, way of uh, finding out about Weka output, which is to do little experiments, come up with a small contrived data set and uh, apply the method and have a look at the output when you know what it's supposed to be. And then you can kind of try and figure out what the output actually means. I'm a great person. I'm a great believer in doing little experiments to learn things. And now you've got Weka sitting there. You can do experiments, create data sets, and so on. Evaluation. There was a question about uh, cross-validation or percentage split with a large data set, say 2,000 data records. Now, I didn't say, or I didn't mean to say, that you shouldn't use cross-validation on large data sets. It's perfectly okay to use cross-validation on large data sets. But if you did have a very large data set, you might find the extra time penalty of cross-validation, you know, a factor of 10 if you're doing 10-fold cross-validation, is too high a price to pay. So if you had, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of instances, then maybe you wouldn't be able to afford to do cross-validation, and that's okay. With 2,000 data records, well, it depends. If you're using 10-fold uh, cross-validation, that's going to be 200 uh, instances in each fold. And it depends on the number of classes, right? If there are a whole lot of classes, then you might not have a representative number of each class in each of those folds. So it just depends. But it's always OK to do cross-validation. Maybe that's the best thing to do, just do cross-validation. Uh, what about uh, the boundary visualizer for colorblind people? I never thought of this, uh, but it was an interesting question. Uh, actually, it's very simple. You can click on a class in the boundary visualizer and you can change the colors it uses. Just click on the name of the class and you get to select the colors used for that class. So uh, I hope that would be sufficient to allow colorblind people to make sense of the boundary visualizer output. Oh, there's been a lot of uh, requests and discussion of a possible follow-up course. Someone said it's like making a Christmas list. Uh, well, I think that's going a little bit far. I hope your Christmases are a little bit more interesting than that. Uh, but anyway, people suggested more classifiers, uh, part, neural networks, and all of the different options for the classifiers. 
I don't really think I'd want to take you through an exhaustive list of classifiers and an exhaustive list of options, you know. You need to learn how to figure these things out for yourself. But I might like to show you a few, a few new classifiers. Supervised and unsupervised filters, we haven't talked much about that distinction. Uh, cost uh, functions, uh, which are very useful in the case of unbalanced data sets, that's a very important thing that I would definitely want to cover in any follow-up course. A clustering, yes, we haven't talked about that. Things like choosing classifiers for particular problems and data preparation and modeling. I really tried to give you the foundations for that in this course, you know. Um, uh, we've talked about what the different classifiers do and how they work and the kind of decision binders they produce. And really, that's all the information you have uh, for choosing classifiers for problems. Uh, implementing data mining in practice, well, yes, that's a, certainly a good topic, rather broad. Uh, it would be easy to show you, and I would like to show you, the experimenter, uh, and maybe the knowledge flow interface and the command line interface, and then maybe some more advanced uh, systems like the MOA system, also from the University of Waikato, for massive online analysis of huge data sets. Well, I said thank you very much indeed for all of your nice feedback and compliments. It's been lovely to hear from you, and I've enjoyed uh, giving this course and talking to you, and maybe we'll see you again, either in person, somewhere in the world, or in the later course. Good luck, and bye for now.